ಓಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೋರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆನ್ ದ ನೈನ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಟುವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ದ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ನೈನ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಇಫ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ನಾಟ್ ರಾಂಗ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ದ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಕಮಿಟೆಡ್ ಥರ್ಟಿ ಒನ್ ಯೆಸ್ ಸೊ ಥರ್ಟಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಥರ್ಟಿ ಒನ್ ಶೋಸ್ ಅಸ್ ದಿ ಪವರ್ಫುಲ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಫಾರ್ಮೇಟಿವ್ ಕೆಪಾಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಡಿವೋಷನ್ ಟು ಗಾಡ್ ಲವ್ ಆಫ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಸೈಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಅಪಿ ಥರ್ಟಿ ಎತ್ ಅಪಿ ಚೇತ್ ಸುದುರಾಚಾರೋ ಭಜತೆ ಮಾಂ ಅನನ್ಯ ಭಾಕ್ ಸಾಧುರೇವ ಸ ಮಂತವ್ಯ ಸಮ್ಯಕ್ ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥಿತೋ ವಹಿ ಸ ಇಫ್ ಅ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇಸ್ ಈವನ್ ಇಫ್ ದ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇಸ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಟು ಈವಿಲ್ ಡೀಡ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅ ಗುಡ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ನಾಟ್ ಮಾರಲ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಯು ನೋ ಮೊರಾಲಿಟಿ ಎಥಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಫೌಂಡೇಶನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಾಲಿಟಿ ಲೈಕ್ ಐ ಸೇ ಆಫನ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಗುಡ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಬಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನಾಟ್ ಬಿ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಗುಡ್ one can be good without being particularly spiritual one can be a good person but one cannot be a truly a spiritual person without being uh, uh, an ethical person but here he is saying just the opposite seems to be um sudurachar a person who is not at all ethical given to all sorts of vices um but if this person acquires bhakti devotion devotion to god ಸಾಧುರೇವ ಸಮಂತವ್ಯ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ಕನ್ಸಿಡರ್ಡ್ ಆಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಅ ಗುಡ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಅ ಸಾಧು ಅ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ವಾಯ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಹಿ ಸೇ ಸಮ್ಯಕ್ ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥಿತೋ ಹಿ ಸ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಹಿ ಹಸ್ ರೈಟ್ಲಿ ರಿಸಾಲ್ವ್ಡ್ ಹಿ ಆರ್ ದ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ರಿಸಾಲ್ವ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ವ್ಯವಸಾಯ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ರಿಲೇಟೆಡ್ ಟು ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಇಂಟೆಂಟ್ ವ್ಯವಸಾಯ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಇಂಟೆಂಟ್ ರಿಸಾಲ್ವ್ ಸಂಕಲ್ಪ ರಿಸಾಲ್ವ್ shraddha where is my faith it shows what we want wanting is important in life you know in spiritual life we keep saying you have to give up all desires give up all desires but be careful there desire is the engine of progress it's not just you see there's the philosophy of manhattan <laughs> of wall street yes yes it powers our modern american economy and the world economy desire yes but personal growth also it's only because we want something that we make efforts it could be money it could be pleasure it could be knowledge uh, it could be power this is all worldly and we we realize the limitations of these things and then we strive for goodness to do good to others and beyond that even transcendent spirituality enlightenment but you have to want it so wanting is the engine and that is expressed in vyavasaya intent resolve and all of us have resolves all of us we we have something that we we driving towards but uh, here he says samyak it reminds us of uh, the buddha when he talks about ashtanga marga not ashtanga yoga ashtanga marga the eight fold way the first one is samyak drishti the right view then the next one does anybody remember samyak sankalpa the right resolve now i have got this wonderful philosophy now i know god realization is possible that's the goal of human life yes that's what i want all right but now now what there could be two things one is well i learned something nice that's one more uh, book i have read one more course i have attended one more uh, youtube talk i have heard now no nothing on to the next talk the next book the next lecture now the resolve that i shall act upon this if this is true if god realization is possible enlightenment possible then th- that this will give me fulfillment then i shall act upon it yeah. and i'll i'll be up and doing so samyak drishti the proper philosophy the right view should be followed by samyak sankalpa the right resolve here the person is resolved rightly and sri krishna gives such a great importance to right resolve because following this right resolve the person will be up and doing 
We will start uh, practicing. We will start moving towards God. So, Samyak Vyavasita. I remember the first of the apostles to visit Athens just after the time of Jesus Christ. Was it St. Paul or St. Peter? I forget. There's a Paul in Athens? There's a beautiful painting. Paul speaking to the Athenians. There's a classic painting of that. Not of that time, of course. The painting was made a thousand years later. But, uh, but it depicts that incident. And it's in the New Testament. The des- in that uh, description. So, you know, the Greeks. They were the, they were the uber sophisticates of that, of that time. So here is somebody from, uh, from, you know, uh, from, from uh, in the ancient Middle East, from Jerusalem, who has come to teach them something new. And where do you go? So Vivekananda comes to Chicago, to the United States. And 2,000 years ago, Paul goes to Greece, to Athens, where you get the best brains, the most sophisticated philosophy. And you go there and people gather around. You can go and give a talk. People will gather around and listen to you. And the Athenians listen to him. He himself writes in his description. Listen to him with great interest. Paul gives them the good news that there is the Savior has come, Jesus Christ, and all of that, the teachings of Jesus Christ. And they listen to him rapt. Next day they don't come. What happened? Didn't you like it? They said, oh, you're great. Great. (laughs) Then... And nothing. That's nice. We'll go and listen to the next speaker tomorrow. <laughs> so they heard it was a nice theory, nice story, nice teachings. Good. Aren't you going to do something about it? Aren't you going to become Christians and start practicing and be part of this new community? And no, no, no. Why should we? We have. We hear all these teachings. You know, every day there's some new teacher. Great. It's it's good. It's a good pastime. You know, you culture yourself, develop yourself intellectually. You understand different points of view. What do you do? Nothing. Don't do anything about it. Samyak vyavasito hisa. Yo yat shraddha saivasa. There is this saying in Vedanta. Whatever your shraddha is, that's what you are. Whatever one wants internally. It's not what one looks like externally. Not even what one says. When you say, what people, don't look at what they say, but look at what they do. The French existentialists, they got that one right. Don't listen to what words a person uses, but watch what they do in life. That shows what they are. What they are is the intent. The intent within. So, samyak vyavasita, he says. It's very important. We must protect our core intent in spiritual life. Develop it, light that flame and nurture it carefully. That's the most valuable thing in life. He says, because they have the right, he has the right intent, this person, he should be seen as a sadhu. But really, we, we say that a person who is doing, doing bad things, isn't it premature? And the next Krishna says, 31. Kshipram bhavati dharmatma, shashvat shantim nigachati, kaunteya pratijani hi, name bhakta pranashyati. Very quickly, he becomes righteous, a good person, and attains eternal peace, O son of Kunti. Proclaim to the world that my devotee never perishes. So, all right. This person very quickly is transformed by that intent and the practices following from that intent. And the life, no, he changes his life and the person becomes transformed. And very quickly, he says. So, it's not when Krishna says, Sudurachar, a person who is given to all sorts of vices and, uh, you know, uh, immoralities, it doesn't mean that a person will continue the vices and also. You know, do a little bit of prayer and meditation and now this person is a bhakta, a devotee. No. Nor does it mean the other way around. It's not giving license for a devotee to, you know, oh, why did I give up all my past bad habits? And now Krishna is saying that you can be um, a not so nice person and be a devotee also. So let me pick those up again. No. Neither can a person given to vices um, and practicing some bhakti. That's not what Krishna is talking about. Nor is a devotee of God allowed to have vices uh, or be evil in some way. No, what he is saying is such a person will quickly be transformed. Anytime anybody plagued with a sense of guilt uh, would come to Sri Ramakrishna, or it would come specially to the, you know, the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, Shivananda, Premananda, 
there was one consistent advice they would give he they would say that you weep and you confess your sins your faults before the lord don't even have to go to a confessor you know in a church before the lord in privacy just in in your own heart and then sincerely vow not to do it again these two things one is wash it away with tears and second don't do it again you see that's easier said than done i remember in our in our college days those were days where smoking was uh, common now it is luckily it's all gone the new generation doesn't even know what an ashtray is <laughs> yeah we grew up with seeing ashtrays everywhere dad had one the cars had one uh, i think at one time even aeroplanes had ashtrays <laughs> can you even think about that today so uh at that time and in the i never smoked because uh, i i had decided to become a monk long ago so i decided i shouldn't take up anything that will be addictive so i can't give it up it would be it would be a tragedy if i couldn't become a monk uh, because uh, i got addicted to smoking cigarettes i didn't know that monks were allowed to smoke actually <laughs> <laughs> but but those days are also gone because in general it's a reflection of society people don't smoke in society so monks also don't smoke anyway but i know on, among my friends you know, there is this person who would claim uh, i uh, gi- i have given up smoking and the other person would say that's nothing i've given it up so many times <laughs> so one quickly changes one's life and decides not to do it again anything evil when one might say that's not so easy you you can quit many times quitting many times means you relapse again well at least there's a sincere deep struggle that it's not okay i'm going to change i have promised the lord i promised my guru i'm going to change so even that is good enough so that's that struggle it will give rise to effects very quickly kshipram very fast very quickly bhavati dharmatma uh, becomes dharmatma here is a technical point here normally when you say dharmatma especially in the context in which the mahabharata was there you know the arjuna and others they immediately think dharmika means of vedika dharmika person who follows the vedic ritualism a person who does lots of rituals and all. not that kind of dharmatma here dharma means the person you know technically they call it bhagavata dharma the dharma of being a devotee of the lord a spiritual person in that sense not a great ritualist a spiritual person and then krishna makes this huge um, declaration pratijani hi name bhakta pranashyati you can declare with confidence o arjuna he is not making a declaration krishna is not saying that um, i declare unto you my devotee does not perish he says you can declare with confidence that the devotee of god does not perish that my devotee does not perish that means one will be transformed and one will become a spiritual person he says shashvat shantim nigachati attains eternal peace not only does this person become a good person very soon but also becomes a spiritual person attains enlightenment and moksha and freedom who the sinner now we might say all right but i am not a villain doesn't apply to me is talking about villains and terrible people Uh, but it applies to all of us because we all carry a certain burden of guilt so that guilt that's what he's also talking about that we can transform it by offering to it to to the lord and vowing to change our ways um, and changing our ways and it will rapidly transform us so that's the power the transformative power of uh, intent devotional practices and changing our ways there is a little um, like a side discussion about this when in s- he says pratijani hi kaunte o son of kunti do you declare you can take it up and make a make a declaration before the world that the devotee of krishna or devotee of god does not perish so pratijani hi means a promise uh, like a proposition a challenge now why doesn't he do that krishna Why doesn't he vow that my devotee will never perish? So these uh, Mahatma Sadhus, you know, in, in Hindi when they teach in Uttarakhand and all, they will make you know very in- interesting insights out of all of this. But to understand that, one needs to know a little bit of the stories behind all of this, you know. So, for example, one talk which I heard, the Sadhu in uh, Hindi, of course, he was saying, 
But Krishna does not say that I vow that my devotee will not perish because, uh, because he doesn't do that because he sometimes breaks his vows. <laughs> there are many cute stories about it. Krishna says that I can vow, I can promise, but I break my promises when it comes to my own devotees. That means for the sake of my devotees, I can break my promises. The story which that sadhu gave was that at the beginning of the Mahabharata war, just before this war has started, he can, you know, Krishna can say to Arjuna, just before this war has started, I, look, I vowed, I will take part in the war on your side, I'll just drive your chariot. But I won't lift a weapon, I won't fight, I won't touch weapons, I won't fight on your side, I won't kill anybody on your side. I mean, fighting from your side, I will not fight against your enemies. And yet, very soon I'm going to break that vow. When the terrible Bhishma is going to attack you, and you, my beloved Arjuna, you are on the point of being defeated and maybe killed, I won't be able to bear it anymore. I shall rush to defend you and, and attack Bhishma. She did the same thing for uh, when Karna, for example. So, multiple times, more than once he bo broke his own vow that he will not lift weapons. But he can't bear it if his devotees are in trouble. So, it, he easily breaks his own vow. So, he tells Arjuna, you are firm of your word. Whatever you say, you're going to do. So, you say, I want you to say that the devotee of the Lord doesn't perish. Yeah. So that's the inner explanation. Just a way of interpreting. But I thought it was very touching, you know. Now, going ahead. So then the next verse is a controversial verse. 32. Mam hi partha vyapa shritya Mam hi partha vyapa shritya Ye pisyu papa yonaya Ye pisyu papa yonaya Striyo vaishya statha shudra Striyo vaishya statha shudra Te pi anti param gatim Te pi anti param gatim Even they who are of sinful birth Women, vaishyas as also shudras Taking refuge in me Verily attain the highest goal so he is actually continuing a theme here, the power of devotion. And here he is saying that people who are born unfortunate, bad karma, yeah. who have deeply bad kar karma uh, and births like animal births, uh, or uh, he is saying people who are born in the, uh, in the Vaishya caste, the Shudra caste and women, they all also attain to enlightenment and freedom by taking uh, refuge in me. But I know, it doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> Very unfortunate phrasing in, in, in today's language. So what does he mean here? Yeah. Because this is a con it's controversial, it's, and it's newly controversial, sort of. Uh, uh, it was uh, in the ancient um, and the medieval commentaries also there is some controversies, but the nature of the controversy is slightly different. Uh, I'll mention that. But here, in today's context, you can immediately see why it would be controversial. Feminists, anti-caste activists, you know, um, so uh, they are up in arms. What do you mean? Even women, or even shudras, the, the, the lowest of the four castes, or the vaishyas, uh, what do you mean? Even they can attain uh, attain um, uh, enlightenment and freedom. So, what would be the explanation? I think the ancient commentators or medieval commentators also knew a little bit of this issue because they also uh, ex gave different explanations. I'll tell you what explanation this commentator gives and multiple explanations. Um, but before I plunge into that, let me just say that uh, to me, the verse is entirely positive. Because consider the alternative. Consider what religions have done since ancient times. There are religions which say um, a, a woman cannot get uh, enlightenment. Not in this birth. You have to be a very devoted person and serve uh, spiritual people and next life you may become spiritual. Um, people of, of a different uh, caste, or of a lower caste, or people who are, some religions would say people who are unbelievers in our religion. They'll burn in hell. Some, some people would say, um, you know, people of uh, other races uh, cannot, um, you know, are not capable of being enlightened. 
So this kind of uh, language was there in uh, uh, religions all throughout. And especially in a religion which was so, a community like the ancient India which was so hierarchical and uh, so caste based. There, if you look at it that way, to me, Krishna is saying the most, uh, um, you know, uh, universal, the most equitable thing possible. He says, everybody, no matter whatever their station in life, no matter what disadvantage they are put in the society we live in. But I can tell you from my perspective, God realization is possible for everybody and they can all attain peace as they are. No question of um, that. Be a good, good boy or girl in the next life you're going to be uh, this pious Brahmin and then only you get enlightenment. No, no, right now. Whatever you are, wherever you are, whatever caste you belong to, whatever gender you belong to, just by devotion to God, you will get enlightenment and freedom. That seems to be the... I mean, the most radical kind of spiritual democracy that there can be. It's open to everybody as they are. And only condition is devotion, love of God. That's all. Now, what are the objections and what, what could be the explanations? So, for, and one example of ancient objection and ancient explanation. So, the um, Upanishads, I think in Chandogya Upanishad, there is a description of of unfortunate births, so a lower caste. I don't think women were mentioned there, but lower castes like Shudras uh, and uh, the outcast, out, outside the traditional four uh, main castes of Hindu society. Um, and whereas those who are Brahmins, Kshatriyas and Vaishyas, they are uh, castes which are privileged and they can get uh, enlightenment much more easily. Chandogya Upanishad, somewhere it's there. And therefore, one of the commentators says, so the Upanishad said that the Vaishya caste is, they can become enlightened. The Vaishyas, for those who don't know, are the, is a broad head under which all business people, trading people, farmers, all of them, they are all, uh, you know, are mostly working class, except the laborers, they are put there. So, and the Upanishad says, they can become enlightened. Why are you saying, why is Krishna saying here, why is he including them under uh, you know, people who can also become enlightened, as if it's a disadvantage to be a Vaishya. Uh, so, there are discussions like that. Now, one explanation could be, you know, the real problem is, that does Krishna, is Krishna saying that somehow women are lesser than men, the Vaishyas and Shudras are lesser than Brahmins and Kshatriyas. Is that what he's saying? That's the main objection. In some sense, are they lesser? The answer to that would be that um, in, uh, in the ancient Indian society, like all, just about every other patriarchal society in the world, women were disadvantaged. There's no doubt about it. And this language here just reflects the condition of women in society. The condition of Shudras in society. Why would it be a bar to, why would it be a disadvantage? Well, there were of course social and economic disadvantages. Vast amounts of social and uh, economic inequalities. Um, I remember reading this um, that book, Yuval Noah Hariri, um, Sapiens. Sapiens. So there is talking about women's equality and this queen, um, I think, Victoria or Elizabeth I, one of the earlier queens. And he writes there, just because the, the monarch of England and the British Empire, the early British Empire was a queen, a woman, that does not mean anything at all. And then he goes in on a rant about one page. He just, All the sentences are like this. Under Her Majesty, the queen, all the, captain, all the generals of the army were men, so were all the lieutenants and colonels and all the admirals of the navy were men and all the captains were men and all the sailors were men. All the people who designed the ships and worked on the ships were men. All the people who traded and you know who, who were merchants and who were laborers and loading and unloading the ships, they were men. All the people who tilled the farms and worked on the new factories which were coming up, they were men. Uh, and and so on and in her and the universities which were beginning to flourish at that time Cambridge Oxford 
all the dons and the professors and they were all men all the students were also men and most of the staff were men all the doctors and so he goes on one whole page everyone in every profession just about everything except a few places which involved manual labor close to home or maybe a few things like a seamstress or uh, like a uh, teacher for children at home and they were women were allowed if they had no other option they could do that but otherwise no and it was not seen, even seen as anything strange the whole idea was that man is ma- made for the field and woman for the house you know when there was a i remember a very interesting debate in the british parliament when they were first time talking about rights for women um james mill john stuart mill's father he gave a powerful argument and the usual arguments against women's rights were being given that uh, you know man is made for the field women for the house why property for women why equal rights why should women get the right to work or, and so on and so forth uh, god has made man and woman different then james mill stood up and said gave a very powerful argument which i think which applies to any kind of discrimination anywhere he said if it is true that god has made man and woman different then why should man make laws about it he said god has made the lion and the deer different you don't have to make a law that since the lion is different and the deer are different the deer should only eat grass and the lion should only eat flesh you don't have to make a law about it because they're different and there is absolute freedom in nature they will do what they're designed to do and therefore he says there should be no law about it there should be absolute freedom equal freedom for everybody if they are different they'll do different things what a powerful argument and now it seems common sense but it didn't at that time i remember in one class introducing western philosophy at at harvard university the professor started with um quoting from a book he was reading it out and there it is said an argument against uh, giving women higher education university education how it will affect their health and it's very bad for them and so on and so forth very well written in clearly 19th century english and then he read out the whole page and then he said can you tell me who wrote this and so we are looking at each other who wrote this maybe some misogynist or somebody some fool so no he was a professor of physiology at harvard university in the late 19th century the person who wrote this book and the whole book on why women shouldn't be allowed into harvard university who was this person lady a very famous uh, writer um in she went to paris in the early 20th century gertrude stein i think no uh, she was american and she went from america to paris later settled down there gertrude stein was it gertrude stein maybe gertrude stein as a young um, uh, woman she attended vivekananda's green acre lectures also she was the first medical student at harvard university under william james professor william james i think it's gertrude stein is to find out very famous person a lady of letters in american literature and so what happened medical student i didn't know that yes she was and she couldn't survive there she was treated so badly being, being the only woman at, at harvard university she quit luckily she quit because then we got her as this great <laughs> woman of letters of uh, literature but see that was the condition and it was the condition across the world and definitely in india for centuries for millennia so that's what uh, krishna is saying and it's also a very hierarchical society caste caste is society and so therefore if you if we were born in a shudra family uh, it would be difficult to be you know enroll for a vedanta class it was meant you would have the right to study the vedas was limited only to the three upper castes um and then right to become a monk was limited to three upper castes and later on to only brahmins and so on and so forth so so that's that's the first thing that i would like to say why this kind of language this kind of language reflects the disadvantaged position of um some people some sections some genders in society in india definitely and across the world also but what he's saying is is uh, uh, is very equalizing because what he is actually what he is saying is that doesn't matter yeah. everybody can become enlightened and everybody can get moksha and freedom um 
pressing a little further. Let's press this a little further. All right. So it is an inequitable society. There's certain genders, certain classes, certain um, groups of people have privilege and many others do not. Even not only in economically, not only socially, but also in religion. Also in religion. So shouldn't we try to make a better society? Can we just say, oh, all right, say the inequitable, doesn't matter, be spiritual, you're all equal, fine. Shouldn't we try to make a better society? That I'm, I am speaking on behalf of, I know, this is, I'm channelizing the activist. So these are the questions you get, actually. So shouldn't we try to make a better society? We should. There's no doubt about it. And we have been trying in the last 100 or 150 years. So transformation has come only recently in the 100, year, 100 odd years, 100, 150 years. I know, I know. I, I, I take walks in Central Park just about every day. And even in the height of the COVID, I was walking there, mostly abandoned. At one time, I saw this group of workmen putting up a statue, three statues, actually. I thought, what happened? And they, they were putting up statues of the suffragettes, the women who fought for the right of, you know, to get uh, the right to vote. So they're the most very beautiful statues, very well-made statues. If you walk down the mall, the literary walk there, so you find it there. And actually someone woke up to the fact that there are no statues of women in Central Park, except Mother Goose. <laughs> so they finally got around to putting up those statues. So this is something that's been ac happening across the world. There's a big change and a good change. If Krishna, if as a result Krishna cannot find examples of disadvantaged people to say, even they can become enlightened, good. The, the people, we have a society when there are no disadvantaged people, uh, that would be even better, no doubt about it. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Those who take refuge in God, maam hi partha vyapashritya, ye pisyuf papa yonaya. Papa yonaya, those who have, were born of lot of bad karma. So here it would refer to animals, for example. One is, one is uh, exceptionally mischievous. One gets born as a dog or a cat. Or, not a dog in Manhattan. That requ requires a lot of good, good karma. <laughs> that requires a lot of good karma. You just have to see it in Central Park. <laughs> Even they, by, the, by devotion to God, taking refuge in God, will get liberation. Now one might question here, if you are not so uh, easily convinced, wait a minute, no matter how intelligent uh, a, you know, a dog or a cat or a bird is, how are they going to take refuge in Krishna? How are they going to become, uh, do they join the ISKCON or what? How, do, how are they going to ch chant uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Ram? How? It's not possible. Well, there are stories, you know, I mean, the, there are very beautiful, touching stories of uh, of animals and birds who were devotees in the in mythology we find uh, in Ramayana the vulture who defended who tried to rescue Sita was killed by Ravana the Gridha the Kagbhushundi then uh, of course uh, Hanuman and uh, and so many other animals who flocked to the cause of Rama and uh, there are so many in uh, Hindu mythology at least there's so many cases of uh, animals who were uh, who were devotees. Who, uh, in, see, from a Hindu perspective, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh pers perspective, it's not such a big deal because these bodies are just like um, cases. They are just like uh, equipment. We are not these bodies. So the same sentient being who was in a human body at one time can be in an animal body and then can again go to a human body. It can happen. And we probably, it has happened. We probably have gone through um, many births, some, many of which were animal births. I remember uh, one monk, yeah, he was telling me that he's so grateful to be a monk, you know. He says, I know what I am. I think I probably come straight from an animal birth to being a monk. <laughs> Without having gone through an interim period of human births. But I am so grateful by the grace of God, I am a monk today. Yeah. Um, Straight from an animal birth, not just a human birth, to becoming a spiritual person. So, Papa Yonaya, Papa means uh, sin or demerit or bad karma. So those who have a lot of bad karma in this life, born in an animal body, even they. Then the Striya, Vaishya, Shudra. So, 
um, women because of all the restrictions that they were put under in society in ancient times. Vaishyas probably because the commentator says always busy in uh, you know profit and loss. He says uh, the commentator here says kevalam krishyadi nirataha always busy in agriculture and business and etc. Krishyadi means agriculture etc. So you know stock price how it's doing Wall Street that's the main concern up and down. And they will use, and it's there, you know, in, in India you find, they will uh, come to a holy person and say, which stocks should I invest in? <laughs> so you are a holy person, yes. So you must have some special powers, maybe. All right, can you use that special powers for, you know, predicting the, playing the stock market? The whole point is to play the stock market. And I met this monk in the Himalayas, once he told me, uh, in some parts of India, North India especially, there is this uh, thing about, these wandering monks have superpowers. So you, if you ask them for an advice on buying a lottery ticket, and they'll tell you the number which you can buy, then that is likely to win. So this monk told me, once he was going from Mathura to Vrindavan, Vrindavan, the place of Krishna. On the way, somebody offered him some gifts. First, they will offer you food. And then next, he said, Baba ji, number bata diji. Tell me a number. <laughs> You might be mystified, what number? But they know what, what it means. Number means you tell them a number and they will take it with, with great respect and they go and look at the lottery tickets and the one which matches that number will buy that. I said, what did you do? And that monk told me, I said, I told him to wait. You wait here. I'll come back and I'll tell you the number. I'm going to Vrindavan. So he took it as a spiritual practice. That man, you know, sat down to wait there. How long will it take? A few hours? It's just nearby. A few hours, one day, two days maybe. And then I said, what, what, what did you do? Um, he will be waiting for you. He said, yeah, then I stayed in Vrindavan for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> so if my attitude is always loss, uh, profit and loss, in that case, um, I will try to turn every occasion, even a spiritual teaching into some way of making a, a killing on the stock market. Uh, so there are these... Attitudes, that might be a hindrance to spiritual life. But even they, if they have uh, devotion to God, it will transform them and they will become not only good people, spiritual people and enlightened. Shudra, those who are the laboring classes, um, um, women, striya, vaishya, tatha, shudra, teapi, yanti, param, gatim, the highest uh, goal that is enlightenment and liberation, all of them. So I don't know if it will convince the activist in you, but anyway, that's the answer. Or oh, these are the answers. Now he is he has said this actually to set up a contrast. He's actually talking to Arjuna. He says, Arjuna, you are privileged. Why can't he's encouraging Arjuna? You can attain God realization in this very life. If they can, with all their disadvantages, all the problems that they are they're put under, then why can't you? So in the 33rd verse. Kimpunar Brahmana Punya Kimpunar Brahmana Punya Bhakta Rajar Shayastatha Bhakta Rajar Shayastatha Anityam Asukham Lokam Anityam Asukham Lokam Imam Prapya Bhajaswamam Imam Prapya Bhajaswamam not to mention virtuous brahmanas and devoted royal sages, having attained this ephemeral joyless body, worship me. So, this is in Sanskrit called Kaimutika Nyaya. Kimuta. What to speak then of? What to speak then of? If people under great disadvantage, they can attain enlightenment and freedom in this life through devotion, what to speak of a person with such great privilege, uh, like you, who can um, uh, attain, um, uh, and so that means you too can become enlightened and free. I, I remember an exercise we as students were put through a few years back. When you enter at Harvard University, there's one orientation program, so about intersectionality and privilege and, uh, you know, 
uh, how you are discriminated against. So there will be big charts put up, and then we are all asked, which category do you feel discriminated against in? You have to tick. So there is gender, there is sexuality, there is uh, uh, economic status, there is migration status. I hadn't gotten my green card at that time, I think. <laughs> migration status, and then there is race, then there is education, what not. So many uh, charts were there. So you have to tick as many as possible to show that uh, where you feel discriminated, where you feel. Now, they had great hopes of me, I thought, uh, because here is a person who's obviously brown, and he is a religious, or religion is another thing, religious minority is a Hindu, and uh, he is obviously strange because he's dressed in orange bedclothes. <laughs> <laughs> and of indeterminate gender, at a, cup, a couple of times I was called madam there. <laughs> <laughs> so they thought I was at the cutting edge of the gender revolution. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yes, when you enter there, they were gi you are were, given these buttons. They, they you know, that will identify which gender series you belong to. That, like the he, sh he series and the she series and the they series. So it will tell people how to refer to you. How would you like to be referred to as he, him, her, his, she, her, hers, they, them, theirs, z, them, zer. And they were, yeah, they were, the, um, and there were a number of others. Some were blank. You can put in your own thing there. <laughs> and I... Uh, uh, collected the whole lot uh, <laughs> to looks of universal admiration. You know, here is the person who is at the cutting edge of the gender revolution. But I had to disappoint all of them because I said, look, I don't feel discriminated against. I'm a man. I'm a Hindu in a Hindu majority country from India. I've come from India. I'm a monk in a community where monks are highly revered. Mm. I so in every category, I seem to be privileged. Now, if in this country here you're going to discriminate, I'm sure some would, some would discriminate against me or uh, try to, I probably wouldn't even notice it. I'm so privileged. So I could see the disappointment in their eyes, you know. <laughs> I could have been a poster child for discrimination. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, there is interesting discussions there. They said, and it's a fact. They said that it's a fact. Actually, if you, uh, it's a state of mind. If you come from a privileged background that creates a certain confidence within you, certain state of privilege, you you you're used to it. As a result, you are not sensitive to too much discrimination, even if it's leveled against you. But the downside is you're not even sensitive to the actual cases of discrimination where it's leveled against other people. You don't see it also. You find either you, you don't see it, or if it's brought to your notice, you feel, oh, it's not such a big deal. Because you have not suffered from it. Uh, you have not suffered from it. So that's one th interesting thing to learn there. It's a fact that right next to you, there are people undergoing discrimination, hurt, trauma, which um, uh, you wouldn't be aware of unless you were sensitized to it by the, in that way. But here Krishna is saying, you are privileged. Um, what, a, what to say about uh, you know the Brahmins. Um, you are a royal. You are a you are a king. You are a prince. You are a kshatriya, a warrior, a general in army, uh, well born, highly educated. You have all privileges. So why can't you become enlightened? You can. And so his conclusion is a powerful statement. Anitya masukam lokam imam prapya bhajaswama. Having come to this joyless world. So specifically world, he says, is, is being embodied. Loka here means deha. Being embodied, born, having taken birth. Anityam asukham. Ephemeral, transitory. It won't last. All of this shall pass away. All of it. All the good, all the bad. Time is passing away very quickly. Embrace spiritual life. He says literally, bhajaswamam. Worship me. Worship God. In a general sense, we would say embrace spiritual life. Knowledge, devotion, love, service, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, jnana yoga. Take it up. You can, you can extend it in the broadest sense. It's not just in Vedanta or the different branches of Hinduism. Buddhism, Jainism, Christianity, Islam, all the great religious traditions of the world have at their core uh, spiritual paths. Don't waste time. Take it up. Anityam. 
impermanent. And the commentator Sridhar Swami says, uh, Anityatvad vilambam akurvan. Because it is ephemeral, because time is flying very fast, do not delay, do not delay. Start, start, start now. Um, asukham, asukham means sukha, pleasure, joy, happiness. There is no real joy, no pleasure, no happiness in this world. Uh, Asukhatvat sukhartham udyamam hitva. Since there is no joy, this is a joyless world, being embodied is a joyless condition, give up these vain attempts at reaching you know, full uh, fulfillment in this world, full satisfaction in this world. It's never going to happen. Nobody has ever attained it. That was the Buddha's first insight, the four noble truths. There is suffering, sarvam dukkham. The cause of suffering is um, uh, desire, trishna. The third, there is a solution. It's not a hopeless case. Um, so a cure is possible. Nirvana is there. Freedom from suffering is possible. And there is a course of treatment. A course of practice. Ashtanga Marga. Eightfold way. So basically, like a doctor, doctor diagnoses a case. What is the problem? One. Um, dukkha. Suffering is the problem. What is the cause? Two. Third. Is a cure possible? Is it a, a curable or incurable condition? It's curable. And what is the treatment for that? Just like that, the Buddha, very clear. So Vivekananda said, the sanest man who ever lived, no cobwebs in that brain. Similarly, Krishna says here, this world is, the great fact about this world is that there is no deep, lasting fulfillment possible here. Learn this fact very quickly. Then what's the point of this world? The point of this world is to spirit, practice spiritual disciplines to become enlightened and free. That's the purpose. And he makes it more clear, world, loka means world, but specifically loka here means embodied. And embodied means thinking I am the body-mind. See, everybody is embodied in that sense. Even the enlightened ones, they are in the body, luckily. That's why they can interact with us. But they, they don't think that they are the body-mind. So they see themselves as this limitless awareness in which the body-mind is experienced and you can, they can use it. But they don't think they are limited to that at all. Vivekananda was reading, he says, are we upset when one hair falls from the body? Uh, we, no, we are not. That's all that is. That's all that death is. The dropping of a, of a, of a body is to you as nothing more than the loss of one hair. So that is the attitude. And that is the realization. So that one must attain. Bhajaswamam. Worship me. Worship the Lord. Then the last verse. And... Uh, the really important verse of this chapter, 34th verse. I was thinking of stopping here and taking up one whole class for this, but anyway, let's see what we can do with this verse. 34th verse. So how do we practice? This is Bhajasvamang, worship me. How? What are the practices? He'll give all the practices in the 34th verse. Manmana bhava mad bhakta Manmana bhava mad bhakta Madhya jimam namaskuru Madhya jimam namaskuru Mami vaishya si kuyuktvevam Mami vaishya si yuktvevam Atmanam matparayana Atmanam matparayana Fix your mind on me, be my devotee, sacrifice to me and bow down to me. Thus fixing the mind on me and having me as the supreme goal, you will attain me alone. Manmana bhava. Everything is here. Manmana bhava. Give your mind to me. Mind, intellect, mana, buddhi. This is a path of jnana, of knowledge. Take up the path of Vedanta, the path of knowledge. Listen to the teachings of the Upanishads and all the associated texts from a competent teacher. Um, contemplate it and then uh, settle yourself down to uh, meditate it. Meditate upon your understanding, upon your, the clarity which is attained. Uh, shavana, manana, niridhyasana. That is what is meant by give your mind to me, your intellect to me. Manmana. That's a deep, I'm giving a deeper interpretation. That uh, all of jnana yoga comes in here. The way of jnana, the way of knowledge. Too difficult and too academic for me. All right. Mad Bhakta, be my uh, devotee, love me. The path of devotion. All right, give, my, give your heart to God. Love God, feel the presence of God. 
do things for God. Just as we have, desire is basically we have fallen in love with the world, not in a good way. A hundred different things, I want, I want, I want. Collect that wanting, the same wanting. Collect that wanting and direct it towards God. That is bhakti. So love God. That's what it is a teaching of the ninth chapter. Fall in love with God. Bhakti yoga is given here. But one thing, you know, we all think that, oh, I believe in God. I am a devotee. Unless you think you're too cool to be a devotee. No? So I am I'm a devotee. But not so fast. That's also not so easy. Because it's not that I like God and I have a little bit of uh, attachment to God and I have a you know, little pull towards God. That's not enough. Ananya. Notice in the 30th verse when he was saying even a person given to evil ways, even a person who's not good should be considered a sadhu if that person is devoted to me. But the word he used was bhajate maam ananya bhag with one pointed devotion stops wanting anything else in the world except God. Stops wanting anything else in the world except God. I want God and only God and nothing else. Sri Ramakrishna at one point he says Ami Bhagavan chara kichui jani na maili bolchi I am taking the name of in the name of the mother, divine mother I say unto you that I know nothing other than God. My whole life is God and only God. But that is devotion. That's bhakti. So we'll hesitate. Hmm, this also seems a little difficult for me. Then the next one. Madhyaji. Literally means sacrifice unto me. Remember that was the kind of worship that was done in those days. Vedic fire rituals. But here sacrifice unto me uh, is karma yoga. Convert all your activities. Your religious activities when you go to a temple or a church. Whatever you do. The prayer and offerings you give there. Unto the Lord. But the secular activities also. In the office, when you are completing an assignment, completing a report, completing a meeting even. <laughs> mentally, offer it to the Lord. As you would offer a flower, uh, mentally offer it to the Lord. Here is the report, here is the meeting, here are the notes of the meeting. And what not you have to do in the meeting, you offer it to the Lord. Uh, work in the family, work in your garden, work whatever work that you do for your personal maintenance. All work can be done as an offering to the Lord. Madhyaji. Sacrifice unto me. Not mine, but thine. I'm giving everything to thee. Again and again and again. Difficult? And next one he says, Mam Namaskuru. At least bow down to me once in a while. <laughs> he says, Namaskuru. Bow down to me. Do namaskar. Uh -huh. Kneel down before the Lord. Bow down. Put your head down on the floor before the Lord. Namaha. Namaha, the Sanskrit word Namaha means salutations. From which Namaste has come, Namaskar has come, Namaskuru this has come. Namaha, the deeper inner meaning is, uh, two kinds of meaning, two kinds of derivations. One is, Swapakarsha Parasya Utkarsha. I, I recognize my own inferiority, my own lowness before the Lord. The excellence of the Lord, I bow down to that. The Lord, the Guru. So, humbling oneself. Otherwise, ego. I am great. That kind of person, never, um, you know, it's the tree which stands stiff and strong against the gale which is swept aside. The one which wind, bends with the wind, that, that survives. So, uh, one is to see the glory of the Lord. In, in front of me, you see, uh, I see the glory of the Lord and I automatically bow down. Vivekananda says, humility does not consist in being a doormat. It consists in seeing the greatness in the other person. And if the other person is the Lord, well, the greatness obviously. So that's one meaning of Namaha, I bow down before the greatness of the Lord. The other meaning of Namaha is, Na Mama, not mine. Giving up everything that is thought to be mine. All my possessions mentally belong to thee, my Lord. All my activities I, I give unto thee, my Lord. All my um, projects, everything is designed so that I can worship you, my Lord. I'm giving it all. It, it, apparently it might not be. It might be a very worldly kind of life. But I'll think that this is the battlefield of Kurukshetra, my Lord, you have put me in. I, I, I do not have the privilege of living in a temple or an ashram or in a mountain cave. Uh, but 
I'm in, the, in a job, in a family, in the midst of society. Well, very good. All of this belongs to you. Literally does because you are the creator of this, all of this. And you have put me here. So I keep on mentally offering all of this to you. Namaskuru. And physically bowing down. So There's a whole science of namaskar. You have to learn it from the Vaishnavas. <laughs> How there is shashtanga. All the parts, uh, eight parts of your body have to touch. Including speech and mind. So flat on the ground before the Lord. And speech is you repeat the mantra of the deity you are bowing down to. Mind is you should visualize the deity. You are, you're, not that the mind is elsewhere. And like, this is done. Next I'm going to go and do that one. <laughs> no. The mind should be there. It becomes a powerful practice. I remember in our monastery, in the main monastery at Belur, uh, I lived there several years. So every day the routine was that, uh, um, you know, after morning meditations or after breakfast, you'd go for pranam. That means salutations to the Lord. So you'd go to the temple of Sri Ramakrishna and bow down there and then circumambulate it. And then uh, come to the temple of uh, Swami Brahmananda, the temple of the Holy Mother Sharada Devi, the temple of Swami Vivekananda, and end with the place where the Samadhi Ghat, where the direct disciples' bodies were cremated, That's then the Ganga, mm. and then the sun, the Surya. You complete this whole cycle of pranams. Now I've done it, and different people do it in different ways, different sequence, but this is the sequence I did it in for several years. And as a result... I, it's a powerful meditation. I can sit quietly. I can actually feel the cool of the stone steps below, beneath my feet when I climb up the temple. I can enter the door. I can see the uh, inner shrine and the deity Sri Ramakrishna sitting there. I can feel the when I bow down. I can feel the coolness of the marble steps on my forehead. I can literally feel it. Every step of the way I know, literally. Because I've done it for years and years and years in a meditative mood. The whole thing, can, I can visualize it from beginning to end. So that is Mam Namaskuru. I had an experience in a temple, one of our ashrams, after morning meditation. What is Namaskar, a salutation? I'll tell you that and end with that. Um, in that temple, after the morning meditation... Everybody had gotten up and left. I was about to get up uh, after having finished the meditation for about an hour or so. And the old Swami, the head of that ashram, he was still there. He had come before every one of us. And he would usually leave the temp um, meditation room after every one of us. So he was sitting there. When I opened my eyes, he had also finished meditation. He was bowing down. Namaskar. But that I still remember, I was stunned to see that bowing down. He was sitting on his meditation mat and he was bowing down. His head was touching the floor. His hands, hands were like this. And he stayed like that. The whole place, as it is very quiet, early in the morning, nobody around. But there was some kind of a deep presence there. And I couldn't get up. And I sat there looking at this old monk, this old Swami in that posture of namaskar before the Lord. And I know this person, how dedicated all his life is. You know, like at this age of nearly 80, he's going endlessly. There's just all he knows is the service of the Lord. And you can see it in that namaskar. Everything in his life is given there to his beloved. And you could feel it. I don't know how else to explain it. I sat there watching, watching, watching. He was not getting up. And I can tell you, those minutes, as the minutes, minutes went by, I was sitting there and watching, my meditation actually deepened then, not the one hour before which I was sitting with eyes closed doing japa and meditation. Those several, not few minutes, several minutes I sat there watching him. That was one of the like in uh, you know, very deep meditations that I had, actually feeling the presence of the Lord. It deepened my bhakti. I felt my bhakti, my devotion had been refreshed. By, I am blessed to have seen that. It's something he, I'm sure he does every day. But I'm blessed to have seen that. I'll end with another example of Namaskara. Um, this is Swami Pavanandaji. He was a disciple of Swami Shivananda. He was an Irishman. 
Uh, he was a radio operator in Burma, now it's called Myanmar, in the interwar years, after First World War, before Second World War. And he read a book about Vivekananda. He thought, I'll go to India and become a disciple of this Vivekananda. He didn't know Vivekananda had passed away long ago. So he went to India. He met Swami Abhedananda, who was here. Both Vivekananda and Abhedananda were in the Vedanta Society. He met Abhedanji, who was in Darjeeling at that time, in that ashram. And he went and studied under Abhedanji. When I met him, he was 90 years old. And he would pull my leg gently. I was a newcomer, absolute novice, just a few months into the order. He would pull my leg gently sometimes. He would say, uh, Vishwarup, can you teach me uh, Sanskrit and the Upanishads? Uh, I said, I don't know much. I studied a little bit in school. Maybe I could try. I thought he was being serious. <laughs> Only later, I found out he had studied the Upanishads under Swami Abhedananda. <laughs> <laughs> There's some a famous Mysore study circle under the great um, Vedanta teachers, Subramanya Mayer, uh, Nikhil Anandaji, Bhutesh Anandaji, Gambhir Anandaji. They were all students in that Mysore study circle. Uh, and this Swami was also there with them. <laughs> so he was pulling my leg, obviously. Um, and I, I, I was, it was a blessed time for me. I took many opportunities to serve him in his old age. There are many, many stories I could share. But one I'll just say. So every day in the evening, after the evening Arati, he would get up and I would walk with him slowly around the temple. He would bow down to the pictures of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna and he had seen many of them. So that was quite amazing to go with him. Sometimes he would tell me a little bit. I still remember him bowing down before the picture of Swami Abhedananda and saying, I consider him my second guru. Because his primary guru, his guru was Swami Shivananda. Um, because when he was studying under Abhedananda ji, um, this Irish man, he learned about Mantra Diksha and he asked Abhidhanji that you give me Mantra Diksha. Abhidhanji said, I am not your guru. Your guru is in Calcutta in Belurmat. You go there. And then he came here. Whom would he meet? None other than M. Mahindranath Gupta, the author of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, who brought him to Belurmat and uh, introduced him to Swami Shivananda where he got initiation. Anyhow, he told me that uh, Abhidhananda, I still remember, bowing down to the picture of Abhidhananda, I consider him my second guru. But what he would do is, when he finished the pranams to all the direct disciples and, and then at the main shrine to Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, Swami Vivekananda, then you'd go to the door, I would accompany him. He lived in a little cottage a long distance away, so I would walk with him down to his cottage in the evening. So the door and the stairs leading downstairs, you'd stand there, I would, you know, we would walk to the door, he would turn around once towards the shrine and bow down, just from standing. I still remember, first time I saw him do that, it literally the hairs on my hand rose because it's like actually seeing some, somebody. I mean, no, no matter what we say, it's a photograph. <laughs> I got such a shock, I looked back immediately. I thought, who, who is he looking at? He's looking at Sri Ramakrishna. But you felt at that moment it was a living presence. So that is, Maam Namaskuru, bow down to me. Maam Namaskuru. One Swami, he told me, and that's, I said that would be the last story, but this will be the last story. <laughs> One Swami, he told me, um, he, many years ago, he was a brahmachari in the main monastery in Belurmat, and his duty was to wipe the, um, the floor of the main shrine where Sri Ramakrishna's image is installed, to wipe it, and you wipe it with a wet cloth. So he was wiping it. And... Uh, he saw Swami Vishuddhanandaji, who was the president of the Ramakrishna order, standing there, looking at the image of Sri Ramakrishna. Mm -hmm. And this Brahmacharya said, he told me, he's a very senior monk now, he told me that, I looked at the Swami and looked at the image and thought, what's he <laughs> looking at? And then the Swami Vishuddhanandaji looked at him and said, he's there, can't you see him? <laughs> Swami Nirvana Anandaji, last one, really, really last one. <laughs> and the, the importance of bowing down. Swami Nirvana Anandaji was the disciple of Swami, uh, he was the disciple of the Holy Mother, but also he was a uh, sevak of Swami Brahmananda. And he was blessed by Swami Brahmananda that he will attain Brahma Jnana in this life, enlightenment in this life. He rose to become the vice president of our order. So this is somebody, it's a small little story about him. Many years later, Swami Nirvana Anandaji, the vice president of our order, 
uh, if those who have seen Belur Mat, they know where he stayed, uh, where Swami Vivekananda, the mango tree associated with Vivekananda is there. Next to it, there is a room upstairs. You stay there. From there, you can see the main temple of Sri Ramakrishna, the new, the big temple. Now, there is a ritual. Upstairs, above the main temple, there is a room. Very few require special permission to go up there. There's a bed. So the whole uh, idea is the deity sleeps there. So the, uh, the pujari, he invites the deity at, the, at night uh, to come up and sleep there. It's all very nicely done. Small, very beautiful, and very powerful atmosphere there. In the morning, you wake up the deity. And the pujari invites the deity to come down to the main temple. Now, this is the background. Every day. Just before um, you know the Mangal Arati at 4 a.m., before that, uh, they would see this Swami, old Swami. He is up from his bed, not in the temple, in his own room. You know, the, the little window is there, holding onto the uh, bars of the window, iron bars, peering into the darkness there. You can see the light shining in the bedroom of Sri Ramakrishna, above the main temple. He's watching. Some, somebody asked him, what do you see? He said, Every day he comes down. I want to see him coming down the downstairs. You can see through the windows there. He, can, he walks down. <laughs> so this is the devotees. You might be skeptical about it, but this is what they experience mystically. We might not see it that way. We are not pure enough. But you can, I can guarantee this. In the presence of such people, you will feel it. And even once or twice if we feel it, and one sign of that, it's something genuine. We will never forget it our whole life. It's something that you never forget. Every time you recall it, every time you feel uplifted, purified, calmed, centered. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu